Awesome. Ignite session three. So those of you that have been uh, coming to it uh, pretty much every week, this, like I said, last week was where we started to kind of get in the meat of things as that was kind of um, building your business. This is probably the most crucial um, uh, session, if you will, as far as getting, getting things going and, and finding business. This is, I think, when you get started, it's you got a lot of things on your plate. You have a lot of um, checklists to check off. You know, if you're on a team, they're having you go through their training. If you're on your own, you're probably going through the 10-week checklist. Uh, there's a lot going on. And so because we're into week three, this is where I really want to hit home on, on a couple different things that you guys should be doing. And I've mentioned it in a couple different ways, but let's, let's, just, let's just reiterate it here. As you start to build your business and as you start to go through and get started, you're going to feel very overwhelmed with all the stuff that you have to, you know, get sign up for and implement and train on and, and see this and see that. But in the, in the meantime, we have to still be doing the most important thing, which is talking to people and lead generating. So what I always try to tell people is, is when you first get started, the, the, the key is, is that you, you have to incorporate lead generation from day one, as well as hack through all of those checklists and all of those operational pieces. And I say hack through because I, I see a lot of people that very much get stuck on, I need to have all of this complete before I can start talking to people. And then if you're in that boat, that's okay. You just have to have the understanding and the reality that if you, if you, take, it to that, if you take it to that extreme, just know that if it takes you three months to, to set your business up and get operationally sound, and you're not talking to people, it can take another uh, month, 60, 90 days before you actually uh, start to produce some business. And so before you know it, you can get into this career and say six months in, I still don't have a piece of business. And that's most likely because we didn't take the time up front to start lead generating and failing forward. You're going to hear me say that often, fail forward, fumble through it, hack through it. It's because this is a new game and this is a new thing for us. And so um, you have to continually progress and, and progressing in our industry is exactly what Ignite 3 is all about. You can sit there and spend hours and hours and hours setting up your website, your business cards, making sure that your, your, your presentations are sound, making sure that you have all of your print material ready. Um, but if you're not finding any business, you're not going to be able to use any part of that on anybody. And so, um, just, just kind of an overall encompassing thing with, with your timeline, when you get started, yeah, you, most of your time is going to be spent operationally, but you need to kind of set yourself with the precedence of every single week, incorporating more lead generation in, as soon as you knock off something off of your, your opening to do list. That means you've just freed up some time. You freed up an area that you need to continue to go. So I always tell people, if you, if you start off maybe week one, um, make sure that 80% of your time is spent on, on getting started in the operations. 20% of that time should be spent on lead generation. So in the world of what we do, um, you know, just simple math, if you work 10 hours a day, then that means two hours of that day needs to be spent on lead generation and the other eight can be spent on operations. Fast forward to week two. You might want to do something more like a 60-40. 60% 60 60 of your time is spent continuing your operations and building your checklist. And then another 40% now is into the lead generation category. Until you can get to the point where 80% of your day or your time spent in real estate is on lead generation and the other 20% of your day is spent on the minutia. So when you get started, you're gonna spend more hours, it's gonna be more frustrating, you're gonna have more things coming at you. And that's why I, I give you the example of the 10 hours. And then when people, you know, when I tell people this and I, and I start talking about 80% of their time needs to be spent on the money-making activities or lead generation, and 20% needs to be spent on operations, what happens is, is over time, you don't need to spend that much time in real estate. Once you're up and running, you don't need to have a 10 hour day unless you're on appointments, showing houses, um, you know, getting contracts signed, negotiating through things. That's where you kind of start to build back up hours, if you will. 
And so once you get started and once you have all of your operational pieces set up and sound, you should only have to work in this industry about four hours a day, about four hours a day. And, and what I mean by that is it's actively working, active four hours a day. Once you start to have business come, then you have some sort of some, some part of your day that's proactive. Um, so for me, and again, I, I'm going to say this on multiple different Ignite sessions. For me, my perfect day, my perfect world is to start around eight. I grab my coffee. I get my to-do list done from eight to 8.30. I'm checking and I'm, I'm deleting all the, the BS emails. I'm making sure that my to-do list is sound for the day. That's eight to 8.30. 8.30 to 9, practicing scripts, practicing dialogue, role play, the things that are going to help me when I get in front of a person. I can practice, a, you know, a, an objection handler. We can practice a, um, a presentation, if you will. But it, it's only a half an hour a day. And that's what I love about our industry is you can get very good and you can be one of the top dogs, one of the elite of the elite in this industry if you just practice a half an hour a day, five days a week. Most of us don't have that discipline yet. And that's why I want you guys to understand how simple this, this job is. It's not easy, it's simple, right? So I'm at nine o'clock, I've got an hour in for the day. I like to lead generate from nine to 11. And then from 11 to noon, I do my tidy up. I do my entry on my database, my cleanup. It, it tags off of what I did from nine to 11. And literally, if I do that every single day and I still don't have business, I, I will go home. I will eat lunch and go home or go home and have lunch. Because what happens is, is if you can keep to that four hour schedule and you methodically regenerate, I'm talking methodical, meaning you never stop from nine to 11. If you can do that, you'll start to have appointments in the afternoon. You'll start to need to spend more time and it's going to take you a longer amount of time than, than 11 to noon to tidy up the database. You're going to start to basically need time to practice more things, meaning maybe you've got a lead generation piece set from nine to 11 and somebody wants to meet you for a buyer's consultation. You might need to take a two hours that afternoon and practice your buyer's consultation. So what I'm saying is, is in perfect world, our job really only needs to take four hours. But when you're still learning, you still need to maybe take, set aside more time to practice some different things that you're, you're having trouble with. And as you get going and as you're methodical and as you go through an entire week of lead generating for at the very minimum 10 hours a day or 10 hours a week, what you start to happen is you start to set appointments, you start to set showings, you start to, you start to work longer hours, but it's, it's, at that point in time, it's more of the, the, the reactiveness between what you did in the proactive hours of the day. Does, does anybody have any questions on that? Because I'm going to beat that home day in and day out every session that we get on, because if you can set that daily habit up to understand that you can be done at noon in this industry and still work as a full-time agent, you're only going to set yourself up with the right habits and you're going to be able to have what we call a work life balance. If you procrastinate and you just continue to wake up and say, I'm going to get some things done. And by the time it's noon that day, you really haven't done much and you know that you need to take the afternoon to do it. What it's, what's, what you're creating is that same habit. And so as you go and you do the activities, what happens is, is all of a sudden you start to have clients, you start to have to negotiate. And you find that there's no time in the day to do it. And next thing you know, you're working until seven, eight o'clock at night when other agents are still crushing it, going home and you're seeing them with their family and everybody at three, four o'clock in the afternoon. They're going to have their long nights too, but more often than not, they're methodical about how they plan their long days. So if you guys have any questions about that, let me know because the habits that you create when you start, first get started are seriously some of the most crucial, okay? So let's talk about it. So, so we just talked about my perfect schedule and, and today is all about that nine to 11 time block. How do we do what we need to do from nine to 11? Who do we call? It's probably one of the most, it's probably one of the most asked questions of me when I'm coaching with somebody and we're sitting down and we're starting to build business. It's who do I talk to? How do I, how do I engage with people? 
how do I think about this? And so that's why Ignite Power Session 3 is so important because this job is simple, just not easy. And so when you see some of these things in here, you're going you're gonna to really think to yourself, well, that makes sense. That's common sense. I, I think there's more to it. There's not. There's, there's no such thing as the golden goose in this industry. It's just we tend to overcomplicate things when we're not ready to engage, not ready to set forth that lead generation time. Okay. So let's, let's get through this. Now, in Ignite, again, everyone's getting lucky. We, we're, we would typically start off by making, a, making 15 minute phone calls to our database or to whoever we're working on. So you're getting off the hook today. But I want to know because I, I see a couple of common faces here. Who is continually tracking their weeks, uh, whether it be this daily 10 4 or anything else that you guys use in your pipeline or in command? Go ahead, shout it out. Jeffrey, you've been on here. Caleb, you've been on here. Tim, um, we've got a couple of new people here. Carolyn, how are you? Haha. <laughs> Um, who's regrettably, their numbers yeah, daily? Regrettably, no. Regrettably, no. Regret regrettably, no. I have not been checking, been tracking my weeks uh, consistently. Okay. okay. And, and what do you think is holding you back from that? Is it just kind of getting going? Is it kind of some of the things that I just spoke on? Exactly right. Yeah. But I fear that maybe some of these habits that I have developed, because um, I certainly have not been, been spending the consistent uh block time in the morning to uh to take care of these things so uh, i think a, a lot of it is uh, intimidation of calling calling the contacts uh, calling my soi and not knowing exactly what information to ask for first because there's so many variables uh as far as yeah well i'm, I'm getting too in depth but there's there's always an excuse basically <laughs> is what it boils down to Jeffrey, I, I, I commend you for being vulnerable. And I, the reason why I, I, I was hoping somebody would chime in is because everything that you just said, I, I'm telling you right now that that is everything I felt when I first started as well. And, it, and I think that if, if everybody had even a hand raised right here, everyone would, would start to feel that same way, right? Um, Grady and, and Tim and Brady, you guys are all on the same team. And some of, some about, something about being on a team holds this accountability piece. And so you guys might be trained to get started on that right habit early on. Jeffrey, if you're, are you on a team, Jeffrey? I am not, no. Okay. And not so yet. when we, when we're, when we're, when we're kind of, on our own and getting going, it, it can be tough. So I commend you for admitting to that because um, I, it's hard to admit to, and I was there. And what, what I realized is that as soon as we play full on, as soon as we understand that there is no magic sauce, it's all about action and taking that, that, that step forward, that's when the results start to come. So I, I appreciate you just kind of bringing that up because I can't tell you that now six years in, I don't struggle with some of that motivation as well. I mean, there's often times where I'm so thankful that I'm in a habit because when I, when I actually don't feel like doing something, I end up doing something because it's just a habit. I feel, it's almost like it's out of place if I don't do something. So on days that I don't feel like doing it from nine to 11, I only may hit 10 contacts. I may not send out any handwritten notes that day, but the key is, is that I still hit those 10 contacts because I was just in a habit and it's just, it's just ingrained in my mind. So I still did something. And then on days where I feel good, why not continue? Why not take lunch? And if I don't have anything in the afternoon, make up for the day of the week that I had a bad day and continue to do another two hours in the afternoon. If we can, if we can, understand that whatever we lack or whatever we're fearful behind there will become a point in time where you have to just you have to just rip the band-aid off and and continue okay so i jeffrey again thank you because um i would be very surprised if everybody raised, raised their hand and said that they were you know hitting con 10 contacts a day 10 connection 10 handwritten notes previewing homes right it, it, there's a lot going on there's a lot of things to start up with so just get started. If, it's, if anything, print off this sheet. 
if anything, start an Excel spreadsheet and add people to your database. Five a day, two a day, three a day. Anything that you can do from the nine to 11 time slot to just get started, all right? And I know that there's a few people out there that's gonna be listening to this and on here that have other jobs and that have, you know, are transitioning. Um, I'll work with you, I'll help you on setting up your week. Uh, because again, if we know that this industry can only take a, an average of three to four hours a day and you have another job, on the days that you're not on that job, you might have to double down and spend eight hours that day on something to make up for the day that you were working. Whatever you're doing, there's, an, there's a way to create that schedule and I'm happy to help you guys, all right? All right, lead generating, right? Lead generating, we're lead generating for opportunities. I, I really like to, to talk about stats right here. I like to talk about the understanding behind some things because we get fearful around calling people. And the reality is, is that we're fearful around kind of some rejection. We're fearful around the awkward conversations. And the reality is, is that if we know the stats, the reality is, is that there's going to be awkward conversations. There's going to be a lot of no's before the yes. And so if we know that, I, 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 ask, I ask each and every one of you, if you know the stats and you understand them and you believe them, why in the world would we ever be afraid to just take, take action, right? And what I mean by that is if we know that when we're cold calling, on average, we have 99 no's to get to one yes on some sort of cold lead generation, it means we're gonna hear 99 no's. It, so if we know we're gonna hear it, why not just start knocking out those 99 no's, right? On the, on the flip side, if we're talking to our sphere of influence and, our, you know, and the people that we know, love, and trust, you know, the best thing to start off with is probably when you get started is anywhere, the stat says about one out of every 25 people you talk to, you might pull a lead. Um, I think it really depends upon you and how comfortable you are. I'm seeing more of an average of anywhere from one to 20 in some people and one to 35, 40 in others. But again, that it's almost double and triple the results of cold lead generation. So if you get used to calling your sphere and you're having a great time converting and you start to cold call or cold lead generate and you get frustrated because you're not having the same results that you were having from calling your sphere of influence, it's just simply because the, the, the statistically speaking, you're not going to have the same results. That's why 98% of all top agents, the number one lead generation source for them is through the people they know, love, and trust, or what we call our sphere of influence, okay? So I like to start off with some of those stats because if we know those stats, then we understand that it's, it's I just need to get over myself and I need to just pick up the phone and, and start to hear 99 no's. Um, if anybody's ever Googled, uh, Google the power of no. The power of no, it, it can really be a powerful article that will help kind of um, just get you over that. Um, there's so many, there's so many, so many quotes. There's so many books that talk about this, right? We all, all have heard, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Um, it, this is very much like that. And that's why it's power session three, um, you, my tone is going to change from some of my night sessions. And it's on purpose because this is something that we all struggle with. This is something that, you know, we all raise our hand and we all have the same thing that Jeffrey's saying to himself. So we're going to get through this and, and we're going to go through this and it's not going to be a very long power session. And it's because it's, it, it's almost too simple. It's just a matter of the action behind it. I, I, I'm not saying I'm sick of hearing people say, I don't know who to call and I don't know who to talk to. I'm not sick of that at all. What I, what I realize when I hear that question is I need to help somebody get over their fear. I need to help somebody that, that if they don't know what to say, I ask them, why are you not practicing your scripts? Right? So in each power session, there's going to be free, powerful scripts for calling. I'm about to start asking everybody if, if you guys are really going back through these power sessions, and reading just, if you just went back through and just read these scripts, 
over and over and over again for 10, 15 minutes a day. And I'm telling you, it only takes a half an hour in this industry to be great. So you can be good even if you just practice 10 to 15 minutes a day. So I really encourage you guys to go through some of these scripts and 99% of you are going to raise your hand like Jeffrey and say, this doesn't sound like me. I'm not sure if I'll ever get there. But the reality is, is that you can't say that until you practice it. Because if, if any of you have kids that have, are learning or have learned how to ride a bike but without training wheels, the reality is, is they're going to say the same things. Mom, I can't do this. It's scary. I want you to hold my hand. I want you to keep me. I want you to make sure that I don't fall. I want you to keep practicing. I'm never going to get this. And what do we know about our kids? We, we know the future because we've been there. We know that they're going to pick up on it. We know that it's a matter of time before they get it, but it's also a matter of time of, of practicing. It's a matter of time of taking time out of your day to help them. And so you have to do the same for yourselves. If you're not doing the same for yourselves, I can tell you that I'm the adult, I'm the, I'm the parent in this relationship. I see the future. I know that these scripts don't sound like you right now. I know that they're wordy. I know that they're, they're hard to remember verbatim. But me as the parent helping you ride without training wheels, I see the future. And the future is, is that if you take the time to just read through them, I don't even care if it's allowed. I don't care if you follow the six step program to learning a script. If you just read them for 10 to 15 minutes a day, you will start to pick up on them in no time flat. So please read through these scripts because this is what's going to help you when you're starting to lead generate, right? So I'm going to keep hitting this home. The key is picking up the phone. That's the hardest part about all of this. And then the second hardest part is just simply saying hello to someone. After that, scripts really just help keep you in alignment. They just help keep you on the phone. They give you ideas of how to handle what we call objections. So I, per I really think that scripts were, were simply designed to just be able to help you pick up the phone, but better yet, help you be prepared for the no's that come. Help you be prepared for the one-off questions around, yes, I wanna sell my home, but I'm only looking to pay three to 4% for a commission. Like, how do you handle that? And if you're afraid to get on the phone because you're afraid of those types of questions, it's just because you're not reading through some of these scripts. So please do yourself a favor and read through these. They're, they're powerful. They get you off the ground and they really, they really help that fear be pushed aside and set aside. Handwritten notes. This is, this is, I said it in power session two, I think when you're building your database and you're building your sphere of influence and you're un, not understanding exactly what you need to say to people and having a hard time pick up, picking up the phone, start sending some mailers, start doing some handwritten notes. Because you, have, you don't have to worry about anybody's response, right? It's all a note to them. So here's some examples for you guys. It's on page 12 if you're listening to this um, and not attending. But here's some easy handwritten notes for after. I think these are for after you call people. But again, if, you, if you're fearful around calling someone, just send them a handwritten note asking them for business or letting them know that you're in real estate or thanking them for the last time that you did get to talk to them or asking them when a good time to reach out would be anything you can do to start getting yourself in front of people is the name of power session three it's all about talking to people all right this is where i really want to take another quick second to kind of pause and talk about the two types of what i call lead generation two different types. You have proactive lead generation and you have reactive lead generation. Darby, I'm going to pick on you real quick. What name, if any, one or more reactive types of lead generation? Reactive? Reactive. Because oh, sure. here's what we all want to do. We all want our phone to ring. We all want to get into this industry and we all want people to have that we all want people to come to us to, uh, to say, I want to buy or sell a home. But when I ask people how that's going to happen, 
what's 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 unreal about this or not not unreal but the reality is, is there's only a couple different ways so go ahead Doug. hey darby i think you're on mute well that's good because i was fumbling so that would have been embarrassing anyway um <laughs> i would say your sign your sign calls um are pretty reactive because you're not expecting them. Okay. So uh, what, what is it? Wait, hold, hold on. Um, we want to we want to under make sure everybody understands. So what is a sign call and how does that happen? So I have a listing out. My sign sitting in the yard and somebody drives by and calls it. <laughs> okay. So a sign call is for your sign being in the yard at one of your listings. What if you don't have a listing because it, it's tough Maybe. for you to, to reach out? maybe it's something i handed out um door knocking flyers maybe something i sent out informationally maybe well, it was an invitation to an that. open house oh that's that true was, that oh. was through a, go ahead <laughs> i can guess in like internet ads and leads um perfect. things like that perfect yeah so so basically what she's getting at is is advertising media your mm -hmm. sign in the yard is advertising if you want to um, put together any sort of online, you know, marketing campaign, um, you know, you might have to spend some money on it. And so that would be a source of reactive lead generation. You throw something out there and hope something sticks. Even though you proactively create the content and media, you didn't have to spend time and, 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 and fear picking up the phone. You can reach a large demographic that way. Great, great job. That's, that's like, I would say media, like, like she combined like the signs and social media and that that's, that's one of the number one reactive lead generation pieces. And I, there's only one other that I can ever think of. And if you got another idea, let me know. Cause most of them fall into the proactiveness. Like a floor call. Yeah, okay. I like that. Yeah. You know what? I, I do like that. That's, that's number three with four calls. So Carolyn, explain to everyone what you would define as a floor call. Well, um, I signed up for floor time a couple times a week. And so if someone calls the, the KW office during my time, then they send me the information or yeah, usually they just call me or, text me and let me know somebody needs me to reach out to them. So perfect. So every office, right? We all have office numbers where it, it leads to our front desk, right? And that's where the general population for someone that's going to be looking to do something with real estate, who doesn't know an agent and they start going through and they, the only thing that they know is to call an agency or an office. You can sign up for shifts where you would receive any sort of lead that would the office would receive from their advertising or from their sign or just from being a brokerage. So Karen, what Carolyn's saying is, is you can sign up for time slots to be on call for when that per anybody calls into the office and is looking to do real estate, that phone call can then be transferred to you. Now there's a lot of different rules and regulations at each and every office. So I encourage you to kind of reach out to the office that you're involved with. Um, if you want to get on that sort of lead rotation, but again, a lot of that comes from that media, right? It comes from the national brokerage being a brand that comes up on Google. Uh, very good. I don't want to discount that at all, but there's one heavy one that we're missing a heavy one that is very, it, 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 it absolutely stinks right now that we can't be doing this. Open houses. There you go, Doug. There I you was, go. And I was going to say that, but then I was like, is that really reactive though? Because I proactively put a lot of work into them. We put a lot of work and effort into getting oh, yeah, it was, started, yeah. but we don't actually have to start the conversation. We're not putting ourselves in front of people people are walking in through the door. So whether you're not, you're ready and nervous, as soon as somebody walks in the door, it makes you be put, it makes you put your A game on. And that's why I think that if you're struggling, open houses are one of the number one things that I wish we could be doing right now. Um, that's the number one thing that got me started. 
Um, that's the number one thing that once we open back up and once open houses are able to be had in a correct manner, um, just so you guys know for the purpose of this video, right now I think it's impossible to do an open house the way that the uh, county and government guidelines uh, have. Um, so I would be very, very, very careful and very leery about anybody doing an open house at this point. I am seeing some agents doing it, but you have to abide by those protocols. And, and to be 100% honest with you, I think that it's, it's, it's almost extremely impossible to adhere 100% to those protocols. And so it's just a matter of time before you have somebody from the state or the state commission um, basically have a, a dummy go through your open house. So I don't know if you guys know this, but they, they have people uh, that go around to different open houses to make sure that we're, as a realtor community, are doing the right things. Um, it obviously happens more often than not in Denver because it's an easier drive for the people that are hired to do that. But we're not that far away, and it has happened in the Longmont area that I know of. Um, so open houses. Other than that, there's not really any other way that I can classify any sort of reactive lead generation source. So for the time being, we have to be pretty proactive or you might have to have some money in the bank um, that you're able to budget and use for marketing dollar for the, your phone to ring through any sort of advertisement, social media um, type of piece. Anybody else want to chime in? Anybody think of anything else that might be um, more of a reactive? A reactive one could be a referral that wasn't given to you, but like your client or SOI uh, gave them your number and they called you. Would that be reactive? That, that definitely is, but, and, and so talk that through with, with me, Tim, because <laughs> I, I have, a, I have a, a thing in my head that says that is still part of something that you did that was proactive. Yeah, that makes sense because, you know, you proactively got your SOI or your old business, but since you did such a good job, they handed out your phone number and you didn't even know, like at that moment, and then you just pick up your phone and it's like, wow, this person's a good lead or maybe a crappy lead, but it's still a lead. Definitely, yeah. The act of picking up your phone, I think, would be reactive, but you only probably got that person to call you because you had a great conversation with somebody in your sphere. And that yeah. means you probably picked up the phone and called your sphere and asked for business at some point. Yeah. Okay. No, really good. I, I, wanna, I, wanna, I want you guys to keep this going because every time I've done this, I, I, I can stem it back to most likely it was through a proactive source. Mm -hmm. Now, it, it, and the only other thing that I can say right there, Tim, is if you were you know, reactively or putting out something on social media and your friend and you never had an interaction, and then you got a phone call from that same person. Um, but again, it would kind of stem back down to the media source, which would still be yeah. unclassified in those one or two categories. So that's that, that it stings to hear that. I'll be honest with you. When, when somebody sat me down and was like, Bruce, okay, we've got to get you going. I, I see the fire in your eyes, but my goodness, you are really, you're really struggling to hit even and talk to 10 people a day. Um, I mean, that's my coach talking to me six years ago. I had a lot of tough conversations with my coach because I didn't turn in anything. I didn't track anything. Um, and what happened was, is my wife became pregnant and I needed to get out of my rental. I was up to my debt and ear. I was up to my ears in debt as far as getting the business started and off the ground. And I still couldn't motivate myself to do things. I'll tell you the number one motivator was learning that my wife was pregnant. Um, I will say from that day forward, there was no such thing as being reactive. Everything became proactive in my life because I was, I was definitely, I was definitely afraid of what was going to happen if I didn't have, if I couldn't support my family. Um, so I had a trigger that happened and I, I don't want anybody to ever get to that point because what can happen if it, I could have easily just, raised my hands and said, I'm out and went and got a, a salary or a part-time job or something just because I would be acting off of fear. So what I'm getting at is, is take the action now before you need it. Take it now before you get to a desperate place. And what you'll realize is that the, even the proactive pieces about of what we're going to talk about 
simple. It's easy. It's just we have to get out of our own way. Any other points? Any other comments? All right. The four C's of prospecting. Again, a lot of this stuff is elementary. A lot of this stuff, when you see it, you're kind of going to go, yeah, it makes sense, right? Uh, the four C's, capture. Capture people's information. When you're talking with anybody and everybody, think of those witty ways to, to ask for information. So I, for one, have business cards, but they are never put in my, in my wallet. They're only ever in my car or on my desk or in my showing binder. And what I do is, is I love to not hand out business cards because in my six years of doing this, I've only ever had one person ever call me from my business card that I've handed out. Everything else was because I was able to capture their information. So I'm not saying I'm anti-business card. I'm saying I'm anti-business card in that when somebody raises their hand and, 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 and wants to be a lead, they're not just going to get my business card. I've got to get their phone number. So my favorite is, oh, you know what? I actually have handed out a couple different cards today and I apologize. I'm actually all out right now. Um, you are serious about looking to buy a home in the future, right? Yeah, of course. Great. What's a, what's a good phone number for you? I'll just, I'll send you a digital business card. Let me get on my phone real quick. And so I'll pop open my phone. I'll get it out. And then what I have done is I've made my own contact in my phone. So I have a contact for myself in my phone. And so whether you're on Android or Apple, you can share a V card or a contact card with someone. I purposely call it my digital business card. And so I just get my phone out and it's right after I said those powerful words, you are looking to do blank with real estate, correct? The answer is always yes. Cause they just told me that a couple seconds ago. And then I say, great, I'll send you my, I'll send you my digital contact card. What's a good phone number I can text that over to you for? What's a good email I can text that over to you? And so then I've got my phone ready and I'm just glaring them in the eyes. And I'm just saying like, let, let's get going. This is part of the process. This is super normal, right? Get their, I obviously have their name. So they give me their phone number. I send, over, or send it over. And then right before I leave the party, right before I leave the grocery store or wherever I met them at, I'll take out my phone. I'll go back in my recent sent text messages. I'll see the phone number, enter in their contact info, type in their name since I already have their phone number, and then ask Siri, ask Google to remind you tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. to enter them into the database or an hour from now, enter them into the database. There, there's ways to capture this information. We just have to understand that there's, there's, there's multiple different witty ways to do it without being the robot. Hi, I'm Bruce Carley, and I work with Keller Williams, and I would like to know if you'd like to buy or sell a home. Oh, great, you would. What would be a good phone number for me to reach you at? It, it's, it, you can do that, but most people will not appreciate that method. Most people are not gonna raise their hand and say, I wanna work with a robot. So capturing people's information is, is simple, yet effective. And the only way to learn how to do it is through scripts and dialogue. Each, each script has three main components. You have the intro, you have the bulk of your conversation, and then you have your expectations. In each category of a script, there's different ways to ask for the correct uh, contact information. So in the intro, you can, you can, you can say something along the lines of, Hey, you know what? If we happen to get disconnected, is this the best phone number to reach you at? During the bulk of your conversation, when you're talking about real estate or whatever it is you're talking about, getting a buyer set up on a home search or talking to a lender or a, a seller who wants to know the market value of their home, right? Oh, that's great. You know what? Let me send over that information through an email. What's a good email for you, right? You can, get cap you can capture information through any part of that conversation. You just got to know where to place it in that script and whatever happens to that conversation. As far as an expectation script goes, um, at, at the end of every call, at the end of every dialogue, you have to 1,000%. I don't care how bad you butcher the intro. 
I don't care how bad you butcher the, the, uh, the bulk of the conversation. You have to set an expectation. And a, a simple expectation is not, hey, I'll give you a call in a few months. The simple expectation is, is I'm going to call you in a few months and I'm just going to reach out to you periodically so that way I can be a resource to you. So when I call you in a few months, I'm not going to ask you to buy a home right then and there. I know that it, you're going to have, uh, you know, I know that you're going to be about eight months away. So I'm really just calling to see if you probably have any questions. That sound okay with you? So it's more than just thinking that we just set an expectation of, oh, I'll call you in a few months. We need to give them the reasons why. We need to set the expectation around when I call you in a month or two, I'm not going to hound you about buying a house because I know you're not going to be ready till April but I will call you because during, during this time, you're gonna have questions that come up. I'm giving them a reason. I'm giving them the, the open invitation to pick up my phone so that way they know I'm not just gonna sit there and hound them about why they're not buying a house. That's what an expectation is. But to capture an information or to, to get their, their contact info, you simply say, you know what? I totally forgot to ask you through this entire conversation. What, how do you spell your last name? If, if, is this the best number to call you at? I want to make sure that I'm not going to connect with you in the next few months over a work phone number. Is this, is this your cell phone number? Am I able to text it? Do you prefer email? Um, so any point in the script, you can capture some info. All right. Connection. The, the second C of prospecting, connecting with people. We've got to get very good at, at shutting up and listening. And the only way to listen is to ask more questions. So that way they can continue to talk. Connecting with someone is simple. It's just not easy. We are ingrained to talk about ourselves. We are ingrained to be human. And an ego is, is something that is just in our inner being. Uh, does anybody know why everyone has a, a deep down inside an ego? You may not show it to the public, but everyone has an ego. Do you know why that is? Anybody? It's okay. We all have an ego because there's been studies done on the brain that says our brains today are no different in any way, shape, or form than the brains of our cavemen ancestors. Now, that, that was profound to me to understand that. And what they really mean by that is our brains had the same capacity to learn back then as they do today. And our brains back then were wired and geared for survival. They are still wired and geared for survival. And through survival instinct comes making sure that we are healthy and sound. It comes from us knowing that we need to protect ourselves. It comes from us knowing that when we go out in the sun without any suntan lotion on, and it's been a few years since we've been out there and our skin is paper white, we know that it, we're going to get burnt. And we know that once we start to feel that heat, we need to get out of the sun because we're, we need to survive. We need to make sure that we don't damage ourselves. So being egotistical is actually a very common and natural thing because the reality is, is that I'm not going to pay your mortgage and nobody else is gonna pay your bills either. And so this job, we're all set out to, to be egotistical and we're all set out to survive and we like to hear our own voice. So the connection piece, if we know that we're all wired that way, we need to be able to connect with people, which means we need to bring out their ego. Sometimes, whether you like it or not, you kinda of gotta feed into something that you don't really wanna to continue to talk about, but you know that it's gonna lead you into the right area. Or, or don't get me wrong, I'm not telling you to work with people you don't want to work with. Um, sometimes, you know, people's egos are just too big. And I know that I don't need to work with someone just to collect a paycheck from somebody that I, I absolutely can't stand, from somebody that I can't relate to, and from somebody that's going to be way too difficult to work with. Those types of people, I'm not, I'm not joking, I won't work with them. But I will work with the people that I know I just need to feed into them. I need to, I need to connect with them. I need to make sure that they feel comfortable talking to me. And that's how you can connect with people. Um, there's a couple different methods and there's a couple different like taglines people have. Um, for example, the Ford method. 
who can talk on the Ford method and what the what that acronym stands for? Come on, somebody's heard the Ford. Ford stands for family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. Thanks, Tim. So family, so Ford is an acronym that will help you in any situation connect with someone. So, and you don't, the, the, here, I'm going to go in order of what Tim just said because it, it makes a nice, you know, word, forward. You don't have to go in order while you're having a conversation. Just try and get through all four letters or at least three. And what I mean by that is, how's the family? How's the family? Oh, I saw you, ha I saw you had one on the way. Talk about their family. Ask them questions about it. People love to talk about their family, right? Next one, Tim. Occupation? <laughs> yes, occupation. So talk yes. about their job. Talking about somebody else's job is going to allow them and probably bring up what you do in talking about your job in real estate. Recreation. What do you like to do for fun? Where are you, where, where are you going out of town this weekend? Are you, you, oh, you're going camping. Great. Talk about what they like to do in their leisure time right and then dreams a, a lot of times people think that when you want to talk to somebody about dreams you got to ask them what their five-year plan is no dreams are simply vacations where's your next vacation spot you know how did you decide to go to um you know the the, the florida keys like what made you prompt that talk about their dreams like their 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 vacations that are coming up um what they you know what makes them tick their hobbies um, things of that nature. So if you can kind of go through and have a conversation around it and you can get down with a conversation and say, man, I, I'm still having trouble connecting with them. That's right. I never asked them about their family yet. Start asking about their family. It doesn't have to be in order, but it's just a simple acronym to be able to hold and use. So again, I'll say it forward family, occupation, recreation, and dreams. If you guys can just think of those when you're trying to connect with people and having a hard time with it, what you'll start to, what you'll start to see is that when you start to bring up those topics, it's because you asked a question. Questions, questions, questions are the most powerful thing that you can do. The most powerful thing that you can do. Um, every single day, what I try and do is I try and ask questions around what I can ask people for the day. So I have an ever running list because I need to ever get better at asking more questions. I have a, I have a list and I just sit here and I, every, every day that I'm having my coffee, maybe I'm done with my to-do list. I will simply write out questions upon questions around something new that I can ask someone. Right. And they can be simple, but what happens is, is it starts to ingrain it in your mind. So I'll just go through a couple. How long will you wait? How much time do you think you'll need? What do you think would be a good idea? Oh gosh. Do you think it would be a good idea to have another call this week? What are your non-negotiables? How far are you willing to go? Have you asked them how they feel? What are some things that we can learn from this? Do you feel like you need more of a challenge? What are you telling yourself? What are the outcomes? What are the outcomes for you not doing this? What, or how can we work together on this? What is something that you can control? How will you react if it's not the outcome you were looking for? I practice and I still practice. I was in this document today practicing. And I'm telling you, we, we never stop practicing, but the way to connect with people, the biggest key component about everything we do is the second C. You, can't, you have to connect in order for somebody to raise their hand to, to tell you that they're elite, okay? And then the three, third and fourth, sometimes you can make a connection and it leads right to a closing. It leads literally right to a, yeah, let's meet tomorrow because I'm looking to get going. Or it leads to, yeah, you know, I'm about a year out, I'm maybe 12 months out or I'm thinking about it, I just need some more information. You would go into more of a cultivation category or what I would call a, a follow-up category, something that you're going to touch base with them over time and talk about.
Any questions on the four four C's? Perfect. I have a Here quick question. Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, do you have a suggest a clever or or witty way to uh, find out the the names of your friends' children? Um, I mean, because especially when the expectation is there that you should maybe should know their names. Uh, Embarrassingly, but yeah, any, any good way to ask that question or get that information? Yeah. Um, I don't have a witty way to share with you, to be honest with you. Um, straight up honesty, my witty way is, gosh darn it, I am so horrible with names. I can't remember your kid's name. I don't, I, I really have just gotten to the point where I don't care if I've asked them 10 times. <laughs> um, well, the reality is, is, and I don't know if you have a kid, Jeffrey, I, I don't know where you're at in life, but nobody remembers my daughter's name. I, it, it's, I, I've realized that my fault of not remembering people or kids' names, it actually is very common throughout everywhere. Nobody remembers my daughter's name, no matter how many times I've talked to them. My, my own flesh and blood still spells my daughter's name wrong on holiday cards, on all sorts of different things. Carolyn, you're, you're laughing, you're smiling and you're shaking your head. Yeah, so I guess I don't have a witty way, especially if, if they've told me multiple different times. I just say, gosh, you know what? I kind of fallen on my sword on this one. Gosh darn it, what was, is it Brody, Brady, Brady, what is it? <laughs> right, and then the other thing is, is Am I asking because I, I want to purposely remember at this point in time? Or, or do I just say, hey, kids, like, come over here, like, get out of, quit jumping on the bed at the house, whatever it is. Um, sometimes I just get, just, I just stop asking, even if I want to know. Now, one of the things that you can do, Jeffrey, to kind of circumvent that is when you our work when you when you have somebody who is a lead let's see if i can pull this up really quick <clears throat> when i'm going through can everybody see my email mm -hmm. perfect when i'm going through and i actually have a lead this is my this is my intake sheet So if you guys don't have one of these for a buyer and a seller, grab one and I can email this to you, no problem. But what I have in here is family members, names and ages. So that way, if the first time I talk to them and I actually find out what their names and, and, and ages are, I'll write it down, but you're not wrong, Jeffrey. I can write this thing down, I can put it in my database and I can be out showing somebody a house and I still forget their names. Um, so I don't have any real ready way of doing it, but sometimes I can go back to my database and go back to these intake sheets and actually look that up. Does that help? It does. Yeah. If you could send me that, that form, uh, that'd be great. Sure. Let me just, uh, let me just get this thing downloaded right now and I'll just share it with the whole group. And Bruce, while you're doing that, um, I'm the same way, but I just make a note in their contact information and command about their kid's name and how old they are or whatever whatever information i find out yep uh. and bruce i don't know if you'd be willing to share the, the list of questions uh, that you presented to us. Uh, you, you don't have to send it, it right now or at all if, if you. If oh, you I'm know. happy to, man. I would like it's, to all, it, it, it's all practice for me. Uh, once, I, once I finally bought into this industry and once I finally bought into the fact that I had all the tools and resources and value in front of me, it was a matter of me taking a hold of it and using it and doing it. Um, I practice every single day, guys, Monday through Friday, a half an hour a day. It's not always scripts, right? Today was scripts. Tuesdays, I like to do my questions, but pretty much every day I do my questions. 
um, I'm happy to share anything that I have with you guys. It's, it's all powerful. Gosh darn it, where's that? Here. All right, my, my presentation packet's coming to you guys. Um, I did just realize that this is a very old packet. Um, I actually don't use any of those lenders in there, uh, but for the most part, everything else is correct. So I apologize if you reach out to any of those lenders and they're not actually in the industry. All right, back. So yeah, questions, right? Connection. We just hit home on this. Um, again, I, I kind of go through Ignite and I kind of teach um, from just understanding and knowing what these what these slides are going to do. Um, connection. It's all about it's all about questions. There's every single thing in here is pretty much about questions. And then right here, family, job, life, etc. So that's the Ford model. So between the Ford model and questions. I'm telling you, that's how you'll make relationships. That's how you'll bring people's guards down. And that's how you'll have people actually raise their hand and let you know that they're looking to do something with you. All right, closing. Like there's a lot of different ways to talk about a close, all right? I'm not, a, I'm not an aggressive closer. I'm more of an indirect type of closer. Would it be okay if I got some information over to you look at and then we can meet to discuss? That hits my style more than give me three names of people who you think might need some real estate assistance right now and I'm ready when you are with my pen and give me their name and their phone number so I can reach out to them. That's just, it's not my style. I know the scripts behind it, but whatever style you find, latch onto it and learn Learn all the scripts. Learn how to do a hard close, soft close, direct and indirect. I love the assumptive close. It sounds like we should meet. I'm available most times this week, so what works best for you? It sounds like we should meet. It's not, you know, we absolutely need to meet what times work best for you. Figure out what your style of closing is, but I would say after connection, the next thing you have to do is you have to be able to ask for business. And when I say ask for business, everybody thinks that it's a hard close. Everybody thinks that it's a very direct, who do you know that wants to buy or sell a home? That's the easiest way to do it. It's the most direct way to do it, but there's all sorts of other ways to do it. And a lot of what it is, is through questions, right? Questions, questions, questions are the name of lead generation, the name of it. Um, cultivate. So cultivate. This is kind of where we talk about touch programs. All right. Let's 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 hit home on this for a couple minutes, because I think what when what happens is is we're fearful to pick up the phone because if somebody says yes, we instantly did it, we instantly start to think now what, how, what do I do with this now that I have this, and if we can understand that with with somebody raising their hand it's very it, it, if we can understand that when somebody raises their hand it, it they need to just have a process begins i don't know how to explain it but when somebody raises their hand and says i want to buy a home with you we need to understand that all we have to have is a process set in place and i can make it very simple for you last last ignite session we hit home on the eight by eight as well as the 33 touch these are for people that you know, love, and trust, and people that you just met. I like to go one step further with this and let you guys know that if you guys are talking to internet leads, because I think that internet lead generation and social media is going to be the name of our game until COVID releases and we can actually get back out there and go to networking events and door knock and open houses. We need to talk about how to cultivate and follow up on internet leads. Whether or not you're doing it just yet, I'm gonna be launching a program for all productivity partners where we're going to start feeding people with internet leads that we design through the, um, that we design and, and implement through the office. We know that that's where real estate's going while we're in this pandemic. And so I need, I need everybody to understand how to follow up with these leads. So first and foremost, you get an internet lead, or a name and phone number from someone. This can actually apply still if it's from a family friend referral. So Tim brought it up, right? Tim said, 
what if your sphere of influence refers you a distant friend of theirs in which you don't know this person have never talked to i would classify anybody's name and information in which you don't know them to either be on an eight by eight campaign or what i'm about to tell you right now okay it's very similar to an eight by eight but what it is is it's a it's a it's a it's a touch program where you need to figure out how to reach out to that person eight different ways over the first four to five weeks. And here's the key. You need to do this until they answer the phone, until they respond. As soon as somebody responds, you need to shut that campaign off. You need to stop the follow-up and put them into a different category or a different touch program. So this is where things get a little complicated. So please stop me, raise your hand, and let me know what you're not understanding. So if I want to talk to somebody or touch somebody, first, Darby, tell me what a touch is. Take yourself off. I, no, I was, that's what I was doing. Um, well, a touch is anything from a phone call, to, but it has to be responsive as well, right? Like, but mm -hmm. to a point, no, okay, good. Nope. So yeah, so if I was to do an eight by eight touch, I might do a phone call, then maybe an email, a text message, I might do a handwritten card. Um, there's a couple of things I would probably do. No, those are great examples of what a touch is. A touch yeah. simply is defined as reaching out to someone directly, proactively, through some source of, of, of communication medium. That's all a touch is. Phone call, handwritten note, pop by, email, um, social media blast, whatever it is that you want to touch someone. Now, reciprocally, when I touch someone, if they respond, that's a contact. That's what we would define as a contact, right? So on this touch program, in four weeks, we need to touch, we need to touch them eight different ways. This is, this, is, this is why it's so easy to get to eight touches in four different weeks. The first time I get their name and phone number, there most likely is going to try and be at least two to three touches with that first piece. One, I'm going to call them and leave them a voicemail. Touch number one. Number two is I'm going to follow up with them through a text message that says something very similar to, hey, this is Bruce Carley. I'm the gentleman that just uh, left you a voicemail. I know that sometimes with our life and job and work and family, um, Communication, uh, communication methods can differ. So I didn't know if text would work best for you today. Anyways, here's my number. If text works best for you, please disregard my voicemail. Happy to help you. Reach out anytime about your home buying needs. Right? So there's two touches in one 10 minute session. Then I call them the next day or I text them the next day. Another touch. The first week we get about four, I get about four of my touches in. So after the first and second day, I like to give it at least another day. So I usually, I usually wait a whole 24 hour period before I would touch them again. And again, it's kind of dependent upon how you want to mix up your mediums. I'm a big phone call guy. I believe in what most of the time, and, and, and I do it myself, most of the time we, we touch people the way that we know works for us. I know that for me, if I got eight different text messages from someone who didn't actually pick up the phone and, and actually call me, it's, it's gonna be a very rare instance that I actually reach out to them. Now, on the other hand, if, if, I, if I signed up for a free window quote and the sales rep is going to call me and leave me voicemails as well as text messages, what eats at me is those voicemails. When I see that, that number come up and leave me another voicemail and another voicemail and another voicemail, and I know that I actually do need to purchase some windows in the very near future, I'm more likely and compelled to call the window guy that left me four different voicemails than the guy that left me four different text messages. Now, if you're sitting back there saying, hey, 
I'm probably the person that would respond more to someone who left me four different text messages versus four different voicemails, then most likely your touch campaign, your cultivative follow-up method is going to be more geared towards that. And you're going to capture the people that are more inclined to respond to text messages. But what I'm getting at is, is if you touch them eight times over the first four weeks, you never know what they're going to gravitate towards. So use a medium and use a mix of both. So that way, no matter who their personality is, they're likely to reach out to you. Does anybody know the secret behind why eight touches and why not more and why not less? guessing because they usually don't pick up right away so it takes a few times for them to respond i don't know no it's because simply there is no secret this the, the real it's a reality so they uh, back in you know back when vacuums you know door-to-door -door vacuum sales was popular uh back when telemarketing first came out when 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 people were in like call centers Data has been being um, uh, uh, captured for years and years and years. Right now, we're in the data technology boom. But with every evolve, with every evolution of technology, came basically data collection, and 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 it still holds true today. Back in the day, when when they used to have call centers and people were calling about different things and telemarketing to people that when before cell phones even came out the average the average touch or the average reach out to a, a family or someone around some sort of business model was that they never got a call back or answered until the seventh or eighth time the seventh or eighth time that's a national average and it has not changed since they started compiling this data and so tim you're a you're a machine when it comes to your internet lead uh calling would you say that any of that stacks up to be true yeah i'd say it's pretty accurate um like after i get it to after i try to call somebody 10 times i feel like they're probably not going to pick up um and you never know honestly when you call them I agree with the first eight calls. You kind of have a 50 50 shot every time you call them. Bingo. The first couple so of that's why I'm, I'm ingraining that eight conversations or eight mediums of touch in the first four weeks. Because after that, yeah, you're still going to want, you're not going to just delete them and cut them off. But just like what Tim said, if they're not going to answer or respond within the first eight times, there's, there's little to no chance that they're going to at some point, but there still is that chance. So you still keep them on a rotation and you might go from instead of eight touches in the first four weeks, you might start to do once a week for five weeks and then once every other week for a while until you get to a point where maybe you're just sending them an email or an automated text message once a month. And so the, something for me is, I don't know where like a lot of other people are getting leads from, but a lot of it is associating how healthy the lead is, especially if it's an internet lead. Um, if they're serious about, if it just like from what you know about them, it looks like they actually do want to buy or sell um, instead of like somebody who doesn't have much information or has a crazy price range that ranges from 200,000 to a million things like that and gauging how serious it might be to do something. Yep. Perfect. Perfect. Any questions on cultivating and, and following up? It is, it is literally, uh, well, I guess, I guess there's a the huge saying that every one of us has heard the fortune is in the follow-up. The fortune is in the follow-up. My right. question for you, Bruce, is what's your standard voicemail on a follow-up that they when they don't answer? I love it. Um, let me let me get to and that. And you've talked to them, at, yeah, it's a follow-up. So you've talked to them at least once. You've talked to them at least once? Yeah. Yep. Um, before I tell you that, yep. there's no secret to it, but the, the key with fortune is in the follow-up is right here. We said it right away. The reality is, is that the first time you call someone and capture some information, 
it's very rare that you would call someone, capture some information, make such a connection that you can close on them that very first phone call, which means that there has to be some follow-up calls. There has to be some sort of follow-up medium. This, this little linear line right here is so rare that the fortune has to be in the follow-up, okay? So if you're not following up, you're, you're literally doing yourself a disservice. You are, letting, you are letting things go because you get too frustrated that they're not answering the first three times. It's the seventh and eighth time that they start to respond and answer. After that, you can almost put them on the line or the fence that says, they're probably not going to, but there still is that chance. So let's, let's put them on a different program that's not so aggressive because at this point, they still know my number and they see my name. So to, to answer Tim's question, I already talked to somebody once and we had a decent conversation and I set the expectation that I'd be following up again. And so my phone call is, or my voicemail is something where I don't, I don't spell out the reason to call me back. I, I, I create more of a, a sense of ir urgency in my voice, right? So it would look something along the lines of, oh, hey, Tim, hey, man, sorry, I missed you. I, I was hoping to share something with you. Um, I know you're not looking uh, to move uh, for another six months, but I really wanted to share this with you. Give me a call back when you get a chance and we'll go from there. Okay. Yeah, I like that. Okay. Now what, now what do you want to share with them, Tim? Uh, just some market updates and um, numbers. That, Perfect. That, with, which I all have ready for when they do answer the actual phone. If they did answer. Great. Exactly whatever you need to share with them is probably what you were going to call them about anyways. So it's super simple, super easy, super quick. Now, if I'm calling somebody, if I'm calling an internet lead, I, per I personally, I stopped leaving voicemails around, Hey, this is Bruce. And I saw that you had registered on our website. Um, it looks like you might be looking for homes. I was just curious to know if you're looking in the next year or six months or whatever my, my voicemail was. I stopped telling them why I was calling if I've never talked to that person before. That voicemail is very simple. Hey, it's Bruce. Oh, man, Nick, I'm sorry I missed you. Uh, give me a call back when you get a chance at, at this number here, 720-600-1725. Hope you're having a good day, man. Talk soon. I want them to feel like I'm an old college friend they forgot about. And it was like they were expecting my call that – I apologize that I didn't, I didn't meet, I didn't, I didn't actually get a hold of them, right? I'm exuberant about it. So that's the way I follow up with a voicemail with somebody that I've never, ever, ever spoke to. Does that help, Tim? Yep, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, you bet. All right. Um, sphere of influence. Uh, we're gonna if 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 you guys need more help with the sphere of influence, um, we're gonna kind of go over this quickly. This is something that you should be working on and in an Ignite Power Session number two is where we really hit home on this. So just to briefly go back over it and kind of reiterate it, your sphere of influence. Okay, so your database is defined as every single person that you have contact information for. That is your database. Not every single person in that list is probably your sphere of influence. So your sphere of influence are what I can I consistently say, the people that you know, love and trust. The people that you know, love and trust. The people that when you walk when you walk by them on the street, you you're compelled to have a conversation with them because you both recognize each other. That's your sphere of influence, right? And we said it earlier, getting into business and and starting to lead generate and finding business the, the easiest and fastest way that you're going to find business is to talk to the people in your sphere of influence. Number one, um, I don't care what kind of session you ever go to, seminar, anything that you ever go to, all the top agents will tell you that their main source of business comes directly from their sphere of influence. Every other lead generation source and model has to be secondary, has to be secondary. So. Um, and I'm going to pick on you three gentlemen again and again and again, because you guys are the only ones I know that are on a team. Uh, Brady, Tim and Grady. 
Yep. Even though you're on a team and even though you have access to all of these internet leads, I'm sure for 100% fact that if you ask Mike and you ask Brooke, if you could focus on your sphere as well as, as, as getting into that lead generation pool, they would most likely laugh and, and encourage you to continue to talk to the people that you know, love and trust. They know that that's one of the best ways to build your business, but they also know that when you first get into the industry, you can only talk to so many people and there's only so many people that are actually in your sphere of influence, right? You might only have 150 to 200 people that you really know, love and trust. And so the reason why they have an internet lead generation pool for you is because it doesn't take very long to get through 150 to 200 people, right? And so if you're calling your database four times a year or every quarter, you have too many other, you have too many other hours in life in the weeks and the months to call more people. So even if you're on a team, even if you're fed those, those, those pond leads or those internet leads, you still better be talking to your sphere of influence and the people that you know, love and trust. And then from the pond and from internet leads, some of those people will actually go into your sphere of influence because of the connection that you're able to make. Um, Brady, I, I know that you, I think you're brand new, but maybe great. I don't know if Grady's still on here or not, but yep. Grady and Grady and Tim, have you guys ran into anybody calling through internet leads where you just made a connection right off the rip? They're not looking to do anything, buy a sell home, sell a home, know anybody that wants to buy or sell a home, but they're super comfortable with you reaching out anytime you want. Have you guys ran into any of that? Today's my first day in the pond, so uh, I've, okay. I've made 10 calls so far. Not yet. <laughs> okay. I definitely ran into that a good amount. And, you know, it's disappointing that, like, there's no business, but it's refreshing um, having a conversation with someone and just uh, catching up with them or just finding out more about their lives. Uh, one lady I talked to, she definitely wasn't going to buy herself, but she was an investor, and I – know that I eventually want to get into investing and I was just talking to her about it and told her that, you know, um, I respect what she does and she really opened up and it was, we had a great conversation and talked for a while. And I think both of us just enjoyed ourselves. So. Perfect. Yeah. So it, it, exactly. And, and, and I want you to take that disappointment out of your, out of your vocabulary with that because during your beginning phases, it is disappointing to find somebody who's ready to talk with you for 35 minutes and you make great connections and there's never, ever going to be a close at that moment in time. But what happens is, is as you go through and you hit your one year mark and your two year mark, and now you're three years into the industry, that person done, uh, followed up with and touched correctly over those years can be some of your number one lead generation sources that you ever will have or see or know. So take the disappointment out because yes, I, I don't disagree with you. It's disappointing to talk with somebody for 35 minutes and find out that it was a waste of time that day. But in the long run, I don't think it'll be a waste of time. So that, that's cool that, you, that you're having those interactions, Tim. Yeah, and then on top of that, just like the buyer, my first buyer, like I've been playing poker with him and meeting people through that. So that just leads into creating your SOI off the internet leads or referrals that you get as well. Bingo, bingo. All right, that's all we're gonna really hit on for sphere of influence. Now we just wanna briefly go over some of these other prospecting sources, which I think we've mentioned. Uh, but if you guys have any questions on it, I'd love for you guys to stop me. I'm not gonna read through word for word. Um, on these next couple of slides, we're gonna wrap this up here, but I will take questions and anything that you guys have around this. So we talked about social media, and most of the likely, um, it's either paid advertisement or it's content that you create and post on your own personal or business page. Um, agent referrals, if you're not tapped into the KW agent referral system or network, I strongly believe you need to do so because um, agents everywhere, are running into people moving to the Denver market. And so if you're not on the agent to agent referral network, I encourage you to get in there and start adding people. Um, open houses, one of the, it is in my opinion, the number one reactive lead generation source or thing that you can do. At this point in time, unfortunately, 
we're not able to do it. Uh, even though the governor and the, and the county say we are, it's, if you read through those guidelines, it's next to impossible. Expired and withdrawn listings. This isn't something that we hit on as well right now in our, in our heavy sellers market. There's, there's very little, um, if any, expired or withdrawn listings out there where somebody still wants to actually sell their home. If you see a withdrawn listing or expired listing that never comes back on the market, most likely it's because that's what they chose to do and, and there was no hard feelings. Um, you know, there's no hard feelings around why they decided not to move or something that happened. But they're gonna be plentiful as the market levels out and as we go back into more of a stabilization market, there's, you're going to see more of that come up. If you need help finding those, um, let your team lead know. Let the, your mentor or your coach know. We'll help you out with that. Uh, for sale by owners, uh, for sale by uh, Fizbo.com, uh, for sale by owners on Zillow. They're people that are looking to sell their home that are raising their hand. And their information is on Zillow, most likely. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page, you can have a direct name and phone number to somebody who's literally looking to sell their home. It can be a fantastic way to capture business. Uh, door knocking and geographical farming, right? Pretty self-explanatory, very much like cold calling. Um, you, you knock around a neighborhood asking people for business, most likely handing out a source of information. So I, I don't like to go through and, and beat the horse around all of these because um, you know, for, for Jeffrey, one of these might strike home for you for Carolyn, she might choose something different. And so if you guys need to really hone in on this, or, or you want me to create a class around one of these, let me know, because again, these are all kind of separate classes, if you will. Um, so read through here. If you, if you do think that you want to tackle any one of these as your lead generation source, this power power session three, will go into it in detail in these next couple of pages. But for the purposes of this video and for what we're going to be doing, um, I want to know kind of what we're about to wrap it up, guys. There's, there's not a whole lot left in here besides actually reading through those pages um, and, and starting to make calls. So what do you guys feel your guys' next action step would be? I mean, go ahead and, and write it in the chat. I want to know from everybody where you're going to go. Tim, I, I, if yours is easy and you want to do the lead pond, man, just shout it out. Brady, Grady, same thing. But for everybody else, I want to know what you guys are committed to. What have we talked about today where you need to get after it and, and you need to take action because there's not a whole lot of ways that we can be proactive in this, in this uh, environment right now. Anybody have any questions? Comments, concerns? All good. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, I thought there was one other thing that I just wanted to hit home on really quickly. Let me look through here real quick. Oh, okay. I know what it was. Talking about your sphere of influence. And, and building that up, if you guys noticed on that little chart, let me, I might as well just go back to it. If you guys go back to this little chart here, a lot of times what people don't know and think about is when we talk about our sphere of influence, a lot of us instantly go to these, these middle ground right here, the people that are our neighbors, immediate family, obviously your spouse or partner or your family your friends and your relatives. And a lot of people stop and they don't think about the outer rim. And these are very awesome lead generation pieces. And these are also things that you need to try and build every single day, right? If you, have, if you work and you service an area in, like if you live in Longmont, but you service Loveland or Fort Collins or any other area outside of town, you may need to make a relationship with doctors in those towns so that way when you have people that move to those areas, you can refer them to a good family pra practitioner. Um, bankers. I stopped going through the, 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 um, the drive through line years ago. And now my bank, the branch that I go to, 
I will say that I, every time I go in there, nine out of 10 of the employees know me by name. And now they ask me how the real estate market is doing. And not once in the past couple of years have I ever asked them for real estate business. I just bring it up that, oh, I'm in a hurry today. I've got to get to a closing. I'm in a hurry today because I need to go show a house. Or today feels good because I actually don't have any appointments right now. I just bring up real estate over and over and over again through my conversations. And never once have I asked anybody for a lead, but I've received two or three out of just one branch from me going in there. And there's so many other agents that have accounts at these branches, but I'm the only one that gets out of the car and actually goes in there. It takes me about 20 seconds extra because normally the, the drive through line's longer anyway. So going through and understanding that your sphere of influence is bigger than you think it is, um, can really help. And this diagram can really help uh, you think about it as well. Um, so if you can't read this, I just name a couple. Um, past coworkers, past jobs right now, you know, when we get into the industry, we're only really thinking about maybe the, the previous job that we had. Uh, but what about the two and three jobs ago? What about your old hairstylist versus your new hairstylist? Because you had to move out of, out of the city, right? You might have two hairstylists that you might want to hit up. A mechanic, your mail carrier, church members, um, people in the industry, mortgage loan originators, title companies, um, your kids' teachers, right? There's, your sphere of influence ends up being bigger than you think. It's just that when we're faced with who do we call today, we don't have a diagram like this in front of us. So I encourage you to get that out and, and take a look at that. Awesome. Any questions, guys? Cool. Well, I hope you guys took away something. Um, nice. Grady's going to hit this pond hard. Thanks for responding here. Uh, Grady's going to hit this pond hard. I can't believe that you have never been in the pond, Grady. Um, I don't think he's here anymore, but um, Grady is, is, is great with scripts. Him and Tim, when we do scripts together, he's, they're fantastic. So I'm surprised he hasn't hit that much. Uh, Brady, I'm going to find more leads through Facebook friends, practice scripts. Oh man, you just hit home, brother. Um, every day from 8.30 to 9, that was the game changer. There's a reason why I'm able to put up 40, 50 transactions a year. And it's only because I know what to say when I get into a real tricky situation. Now I absolutely love, like I have a, a desire for somebody to hit me with an objection that I can't handle. And that desire only came from practicing it over and over and over again. I love that right there. That will be your game changer. If you only lead generate from nine to 10 every day, but you practice your scripts for a half an hour every day, you will still crush it. That's the key piece about all of this is picking up the phone is step one. And step two is practicing your scripts. If you can just do those two things, you'll crush it in real estate. You don't even need business cards. You won't need a website. You won't need a headshot. You won't need any of that. You won't even need nice clothes. I, I mean, I'm wearing a, a $15 Detroit knockoff pullover. You don't need anything nice in this industry. You just need those two things, practice and pick up the phone. Nice. Awesome, guys. I appreciate everybody's time. I'm going to stop the recording here.